Good morning. I guess he said stage, so I'll step on the stage. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Karen Saltzer, as Steve said, CEO of Bloomberg Media, and I'm really delighted to see so many of you here today, so many leaders in government and business, um, and you are in for a treat. So um, UNGA and Climate Week is an important time for Bloomberg. As I'm sure you know, Michael Bloomberg is Special Envoy for Climate to the UN. Additionally, given the increasing importance of climate change and of reducing emissions to governments and to investors, Bloomberg itself also has an important role to play because our financial data, our insights, our information really helps make people make smart decisions. And in the increasingly fractured political landscape today, making smart decisions is ever more needed. So Bloomberg is known for its trusted global newsroom, but we also have a really deep bench of incredibly talented economists, one of which is here joining us today, Adriana Lupita. Adriana is based in Brazil and is an expert in the economies of the global south. And given the increasingly complicated um, economies and given the increasingly um, changing and shifting global supply chains and global trade, hearing from Adriana is, um, I think, going to shed a lot of light on opportunities and trends. Speaking of Brazil, the Bloomberg New Economy, which is our flagship media brand, as well as a global community, is holding a special event in Sao Paulo in October alongside the B20. The Bloomberg New Economy is really meant to bridge the conversation between the global south and the global north. It's also an opportunity to help mobilize private capital for public good. And so we hope that um, in Brazil, as we are laying a foundation ahead of the G20, which is in November in Brazil, and ahead of COP30, which will be in Brazil in 2025, that we're laying a foundation for those important convenings and conversations. And I invite all of you to join us in October. We'd love to have you. After Adriana shares some insights, I am really excited that we have a fantastic interview to share with you, hosted by Eric Schatzker, who's the editorial director for Bloomberg New Economy, who you've probably seen on TV interviewing business and government leaders. He'll be interviewing Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who really needs no introduction. He's a preeminent economist who's won the Nobel Prize for Economics, and I cannot wait to hear what he has to say about our changing world. But first, let me turn the stage over to Adriana. You are in for a treat. Thank you again. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Karen. So my name is Adriana, and I'm going to speak to you uh, as we are going to discuss here the prospects for sustained growth in the global south. I'm going to share some insights with you that perhaps can help in the discussions that we will have ahead. So let's just start by uh, thinking that in this, different, this changing world, we will have to ha come up with different strategies than we did in the past. No discussion about the future of the global economy is complete if it doesn't involve the global south. I'm sure that everyone in this room knows that, but it's important to bear in mind that the global south, this uh, group of developing and emerging economies, already comprise over 40% of the world's GDP. 
and Bloomberg Economics projects it this share to jump to 60% by 2060, which is just around the corner. Not only are we going to be a large share of the GDP, but the Global South has been and will continue to be a major driver of global growth. Since the beginning of the century, the Global South has contributed with over half of the global growth. And we project that by 2060, the, pro the uh, contribution of the Global South to the global growth is going to be seven times as large as the one from the advanced economies. Of course, the demographic dividend from the Global South is behind such expansion. The United Nations forecasts see that by 2060, seven for every one person in the global no north, there will be seven in the global south. Not only that, the population in the global south will continue to be expanding by 2060, whereas the population of the global north will start shrinking from the end of the next decade. In, by 2060, probably the global south will be home to 88% of the prime working age population in the entire world. Of course, a fastly rising uh, working force is a tremendous advantage and gives the Global South an edge to continue expanding faster than the advanced economies. But as you know, this is only part of the equation. It doesn't do to have an edge and to try to explore that advantage if you don't have any strategy. So let's discuss a little bit about the possible strategies for growth. For the past decades, globalization was a buzzword. Everybody wanted to grow based on globalization. And indeed, it helped several developing economies to grow based on export-driven strategies. But there's very good reason to imagine that going forward, that is going to be a lot harder to pull off. That means, and why is that? Because when we think about uh, this world that is becoming more fragmented, uh, we cannot imagine uh, how the countries can uh, focus on looking only outside. They will have to start looking inside. One example of how the protectionism is on the rise, and I imagine that this is not particular to the U.S., it's probably going to be spreading for other countries, is the case of the U.S. election. It offers a good example for us to see how things can unfold. So let's imagine for a moment the case for a 60% tariff on Chinese imports, exports, and a 10 to 20% tariff on the exports from the rest of the world, as it is outlined by one of the candidates in this election. Bloomberg Economics ran an, uh, a complex study and showed that the global GDP can be, in a matter of three years, about 0.4% smaller just because of this changing policy. That might sound like a tiny number, but let's translate that into dollars. That's more than half a trillion dollars, just because one single policy. And this is assuming that only China retaliates to the change in the trade policy. If we extend that to a retaliation from all the trade partners, the damage can be even larger at 0.5%. Once again, it seems like a tiny number, but it is not that tiny if you consider that it is only one single changing policy. One important thing to remember is that there are no winners in this trade war. Every country on net terms, be it China, but also the US, will, it will be worse off if we head for this kind of scenario. This shows uh, the, impl the implication, the estimate of the GDP hit for several countries in our analysis. And as you can see, no one is gaining anything, right? And uh, of course, this means that several countries other than China in the global south will also take a hit. And if that is the case, and the countries in this, represented in this group want to grow more in the coming years, they will have to look inside. And how can you grow based on the domestic demand? I think there is one potential strategy, which is making it easier for households to consume more. But let me be very clear here not consume more driven by a debt-driven splurge. I'm not saying that. I'm saying perhaps improving income distribution in a way that more money gets to the hands of people that have higher necessities and are more inclined to spend rather to save. Mapping the, to the right shows that there is a lot of room for improvement in the global south as we go to, uh, as we discuss income distribution. Quite unfortunately, 
most of the countries that have the most unequal income distribution in the world are in the global south. So working to change that picture is very important and can be very helpful for growth. That can come from either income uh, distribution efforts from income transfers, or it can also come from uh, measures that spur sustained uh, structural change, such as the ones that make the lower income population more productive and have access to more opportunities. But of course, one side effect of having more money in the hands of the have-nots rather than in the have hands of the haves is that these people are less inclined to save, which means that there is less money available domestically to fund, for instance, investment in infrastructure and other things that the countries need. So as if we move towards that direction, the countries will, net, will need to be more and more relying on external funding. But not all external funding is made equal, and it's important for you to remember that when you think about this. Number one, short-term capital inflows make the countries more crisis prone, more prone to financial crisis in general. External debt, while important and welcome in several cases, is a mortgage on the country's future. So what should you be trying to attract? Foreign direct investment, by the nickname of FDI, and Bloomberg Media has run a survey uh, on, with three, over 3,000 investors to try to uh, listen to their hopes and fears and, understand, and under, understand how they make their investment decisions. The results are here in this chart. What you can see is that, of course, investors are drawn to new, large new customer markets, lower production costs, but also the to at the top of their uh, hopes, they claim to be seeking opportunities to invest in firms and countries that offer tech and innovation capabilities. So that's an avenue to attract uh, uh, foreign direct investment. This is way more important than, for instance, one thing that countries tend to rely a lot, which is tax relief, which is very costly, very ineffective, and not that attractive. On the other hand, not to the surprise of anyone in this room, investors tend to keep away from countries that are, that are politically or economically, economically unstable. So of course, by all means, while you focus on the things that can attract investment, don't forget to do the homework on keeping the country stable. Among the opportunities that uh, we have uh, for investment, one of the things that we think at Bloomberg Economics that could attract investment to the global south is the greenshoring. And why is that? Because uh, Protectionism is not the only word, buzzword that we are hearing uh, as of now. As was already mentioned here, climate change is a, a rising challenge. And uh, because of that, firms and countries are seeking to have greener, more efficient, cheaper uh, production chains, decarbonized production. So what does it take to make a country a good ring-shoring destination? We think that number one, of course, is the, uh, the access to cheap and abundant green energy, or at least the potential to have access to that. Number two is having good trade connections, because after all, uh, after all you want it to be part of a global supply chain, and that is, uh, you need to have access to other markets for that. And number three, as production process become increasingly smarter, it need, the country needs to be prepared for artificial intelligence. So we, gave, we attempt to gauge the greenshoring potential of several economies by combining these three fronts with indices that we have, Bloomberg BNFs, own climate scope, IMF, AI preparedness, trade connections from a, a gravity database, and we come up with this, which is, of course, a rough estimate of how each country stands. It's easy to see that the rich economies stand out as having the best uh, green short potential. But if you pay attention to the chart, you will see several countries in the global south not very far behind. And if you're looking at the map and you see that your country is not faring well in this ranking, well, there's homework to be done. You can prepare your country to be more trade connected, better prepared for AI, and uh, leverage on green energy. So as a conclusion, I would like to share with you a few key takeaways that I hope that, they, that set the mood for the conversation that you will have ahead. There is, uh, I think that the Global South is poised to take center stage in the world economy in the next decades. There's no going back. But 
It can ex expand its influence, it can expand its attractiveness, and it can seek more representation in the global arena. But that requires them that they have, do the homework and make sure that it, it has the means to realize its full potential. Sustainable growth requires including the poorer. This is not just for the sake of empathy, this is an economic strategy. And uh, to invite foreign direct investment into the country, you need to make sure that your country is stable, innovative, and efficient. Countries can and should improve their attractiveness by readying for digital transformation and exploring their green energy. And yes, the world is becoming more fragmented, but that's no excuse to try to isolate yourself, try to be more connected in trade as well. I hope that this uh, sets the mood for interesting conversations moving forward. Thank you so much for your attention. Hope to see you in Sao Paulo. And now um, have a good rest of the program. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Eric Schatzker. I am the Editorial Director of Bloomberg New Economy, and I'm absolutely delighted to see you all here this morning. Um, as you can see here, the theme of this event and the theme for Bloomberg New Economy this year is new reality, new rules. Uh, you'll hear that today. You're going to hear it in Sao Paulo next month. And few people understand this new reality better um, than our featured guest. As you heard from Karen earlier, his name is Professor Joseph Stieglitz. He is indeed a Nobel Laureate. I'm going to tell you a few other things about Joe that you ought to know. He's past chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He's a former World Bank chief economist. He's a critic, um, at times a fierce critic, of globalization, of laissez-faire economics, of multilateral institutions. And Joe, you are the author of how many books now? Oh, I don't know. He doesn't even know how many books he's written. He's that prolific. Uh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph Stieglitz to the stage. Joe, this audience has so many questions. Fortunately, you have an unlimited supply of answers. Here's where we're going to begin. In fact, before we begin, let me just say this, everyone. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you didn't get to where you are as policymakers, as elected officials, by being shy. And so don't be shy today. When I open up the floor to questions, I expect to see your hands go up and a microphone will be promptly brought to you. And we'd love, both Professor Stieglitz and I would love to hear from you. Uh, but as I said, Joe, there is a place to begin. In fact, it's today, but what we're looking at is an event that's going to take place precisely 40 days from now. That is, of course, the US election. Americans are going to elect a new president, and the choice they'll make between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump has, it goes without saying, huge implications, not just for this country, but arguably for every country on the planet. In your mind, how consequential is this election? Oh, very. Uh, I, can't, I, I, I can't describe, I think everybody believes uh, that I know that this is almost existential um, in several ways. Uh, democracy is really important for most of us. And one of the candidates says, you don't have to worry about having elections after you elect me. Um, I'll solve the problem uh, of your having to waste your time in these elections. Uh, he, he's not committed to democracy. Um, for the rest of the world, uh, he's not committed to global cooperation in any way. And Adriana gave some, you know, I think really powerful statistics to help frame uh, what's going on. He's talked about 60% tariffs against China, but he's also talked about tariffs against our allies, you know, against Europe. So uh, she just, uh, Adriana just described what happens just on the China tariffs. And only up to 60%, at some, you know, he's a little erratic. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, at times has talked to 100% tariffs, uh, and that would amplify it. Uh, one more thing, uh, um, uh, I was uh, in a, 
relatively small meeting I can't, uh, with the, one of the leaders of the uh, Republican Party who was explaining uh, why Trump is a good international negotiator and would succeed better than Harris. And that argument was that he was so unpredictable <laughs> that they would give in if he said, you know, if you don't do this, I'll drop a nuclear bomb on you. They weren't sure whether he would or not. So, um, you know, there is a, in, in game theory, you know, a branch of economics, there is an argument about what they call rational irrationality. If you're in normal game theory, you, you, you assume you're playing with somebody rational on the other side, you know, and you look at the equilibrium from that. Uh, but if you are truly irrational, it gives you a little bit of advantage because the other guy doesn't really know what you'll do. But on the other hand, for most of us, the idea that the guy who has his finger on the atomic bomb is a little chaotic doesn't give us a lot of comfort. So a highly consequential election, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you alluded to this. Um, neither candidate has given us a particularly clear picture of what objectives or priorities that he or she is, is, would pursue as president of this country, Trump, you described him as erratic. He is indeed all over the place. <laughs> um, Harris, for her part, is notably short on details, has been up until now. Uh, no matter who wins, of course, though, change is coming, change of a sort. It might be radical change. It might be incremental change. And I think we need you to help us understand, Joe, um, what to expect from each candidate in terms of economic policies, fiscal, trade, et cetera, and how, most importantly, how disruptive those policies might be for the rest of the world, and particularly given our audience here, the Global South. You started uh, by talking about Trump in the context of tariffs. Can we explore that a little further? What would, and Adriana went into some of this, what would a tariff regime along the lines of what he has, I'll say, articulated, um, that might be a generous statement because <laughs> It's not all that <laughs> consistent, but he, he clearly is in favor of much higher tariffs. What would that mean for the world? Oh, it, it, it would be really going back in time into uh, a world of less interdependence and uh, less efficiency. Um, I think both candidates have a, will have a, policies that recognize that we went too far in what's sometimes called hyper-globalization. Uh, and the evidence was that during 2000, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the United States couldn't produce even simple products like face masks and mm -hmm. protect, protective gear. Um, let alone ventilators. Let alone yeah. ventilators or, or even tests. And, and uh, Europe, uh, had become totally dependent on Russian gas. Uh, in a book, one of the books I wrote was called Making Globalization Work. After I wrote this book called uh, Globalization Ex Discontent that explained what was wrong, my wife said, you have to give the answers. You can't just be a critic. And so I wrote that book. But in that, uh, one of the things I said was, uh, it, it is really crazy for Germany to be so dependent on Russian gas. And, and indeed it was. And indeed it was. Um, you know, Bush could look in the eyes of, of Putin and say, there's somebody I could trust. But I think the rest of the world did feel quite, quite so comfortable. So, um, uh, so we, there will be an adjustment from hyper-globalization in, in both parties. But the difference is one in which I think Harris is committed to a global framework, working with what she views, you know, with our, with our partners, close partners of those, you know, like our NATO allies, but also our partners in the South. And so it's, it's trying to avoid a rupture and doing everything we can as we adjust our economy 
to embrace the rest of the world. So that's one. But the other one is, uh, I think the way to understand Trump is his view of the world is a zero sum. And that means if the US does better, other countries would do worse, other countries do better. You, you saw the charts about how other countries were do doing. His view is that's at the expense of the United States. And so any of you who study at economics know that the, we believe it's a positive sum. If the developing countries and emerging markets grow, it's a better global world and helps us. So it's not zero sum, it's positive sum. And that is the fundamental philosophical difference between the two candidates. Uh, I did mention- On this, on this issue. There are a lot on of this issues. issue. <laughs> uh, I, I mentioned that, that um, Vice President Harris has been somewhat parsimonious when it comes to revealing the details of her eco economic plan. We might hear more from the Vice President today, and I know you have some insights into what she's thinking and what she might say, Joe. So perhaps share some of that with us and also tell us, and I think this is important, how in economic terms a Harris presidency would differ from a Biden, Biden presidency. Okay, so yeah, I think she's going to give a great speech today. Um, I think she's trying to try to, she's going to outline uh, uh, both the objectives and the uh, strategy of getting there. Um, it's going to, in many ways, be a continuation, but it's there are a couple things that are big changes in emphases. And, and, uh, um, so it's going to be a continuation, actually picking up on what Andriana uh, said, uh, uh, building uh, the economy from the middle. So if you know some of the dialogue, that uh, discussion that that characterized the era of neoliberalism in the last 40 years, it was trickle down. Uh, give enough money to the top and everybody would share. It didn't work out very well. I mean, what we got is, it's actually it was a lot of trickle up, not trickle down, and we got growing inequality. And I, I think Adriana was right. It, it, did hurt our growth. So the philosophy is really build out from the middle. So it's going to be a big emphasis on, on strengthening the middle class. Um, the uh, three things that will be emphasized uh, today in the today's speech. Uh, the first, uh, addressing the issue that's on almost everybody's mind, a short run issue, but also long run, our costs, inflation. And um, there will be, uh, you know, some of the things that, that uh, she's talked about before, like price gouging, and that was not understood well when she talked about it. Price gouging is illegal in almost everywhere. Almost every state has a law. People described it as it was price control. We have price gouging laws everywhere, and it just says, you know, if you have a flood like we had in Katrina in New Orleans, you can't go and, and, and jack up the prices and people are starving. Uh, you can't take advantage of that. Uh, there's a limit to how you can take advantage of specific circumstances. That's not price fixing. That's exploit, you know, extremes of exploitation. Um, so that, but that's not really the, the core. The core is, a whole set of, uh, of policies, uh, you know, for instance, uh, here is a big difference. Um, the IRA is aimed at getting more renewable energy, a theme that you've, you know, onto, and renewable energy now is lower than fossil fuel costs. So it's going to be clean energy, stable energy. I always say that uh, as erratic as the weather is, it's more stable than Putin. And, and we can you know, have a more stable uh, energy system if we can rely on the weather, a diversified weather, wind, solar, some backup, than if we rely on autocrats. So that's part of it. But in the IRA, there were important provisions for getting drug prices down. Uh, all that would be repealed. And, and we've seen that, all, like on insulin already. 
So that's, and, and an important ingredient that, that will be talked about is housing. In many countries around the world, uh, housing costs have um, uh, soared, and the question is what are the impediments and what can we do to get more housing? The market ought to be taking care of it. Let's, let's get the house uprising. Part of that they'll talk about will be innovation in housing. One of the things, again, innovation is really important. We haven't had innovation. Uh, in housing. Um, so there's a whole bucket, and I ha haven't been able to talk about all of them. The second one is a whole set of things on opportunity and entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, it's really your innovation uh, agenda, but saying that we can combine that innovation and getting innovation down to uh, ordinary individuals. Uh, one of the concerns in the United States, we think of it as an innovative economy, is the fraction of firms that are young is declining. Not a surprise for those of us who see market power. And, uh, you know, the business model, those of you who know Silicon Valley, the, the business model of those who start firms, everybody talks about all our startups. Their business model is to be acquired by Meta or Alphabet, by Google. That's not a good business model. And it's a very narrow set of, uh, of innovation. So it's going to try to make a more inclusive kind of innovation framework. And uh, the final thing is, uh, and this is really central to uh, the discussion this morning, uh, is uh, uh, getting a better hold of strategic industries. And uh, that means, you might say, I, I would put it, that's not how they're putting it, um, restoring national sovereignty, economic sovereignty. Mm -hmm. We're too dependent on Taiwan for chips. Uh, we need to uh, expand our solar energy. You know, we have a lot of sun, and we ought to uh, take advantage of that. Um, but also, there are going to be new industries. You, you mentioned, you know, AI. Uh, make sure we have uh, the leadership in that. So that's going to be the third bucket that will will be talked about. Well, I'm glad that the vice president is going to address these issues today, <laughs> uh, because it gives us an opportunity uh, now that you've given us a preview of what we're likely to hear to talk about a couple of them. Um, strategic industries is the reindustrialization of North America and of Europe a net negative or a net positive for the Global South? Well, I think anything that creates more stability for the global economy is a net positive. And uh, the fact that we had gone too far in deindustrialization uh, was a mistake. But I hope, and this is where I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussions uh, if Harris gets elected, exactly where this is going to play how this is going to play out. You know, the economy of the 21st century uh, is not a manufacturing economy. Manufacturing is down to uh, eight, nine, ten percent of employment and GDP. It's service sector. It's research. We're a knowledge economy. It's a service-based economy. Uh, we're a care economy, taking care of old people like me. Uh, so, so we've we've uh, the structure of the economy is different, and we need to be efficient in each of these dimensions. So, um, and and those are clearly not threats. Those are really things where we can work together. I think the fundamental thing is going to be we're going to be de-risking. We are, uh, which is the vocabulary that Europe uses a lot more than we do, and uh, de-risking where, unfortunately, where where a, a real challenge for uh, the emerging markets in developing countries is going to be uh, China, mm -hmm. because we, you know, and the bipartisan view is that. Uh, China represents a risk. Or a threat. A threat. And, you know, I think at this point, there's very little evidence of that. Um, China's behaved a, 
you know, a little, I, I would say, naughty in the South China Seas more aggressively than uh, I think is in its own self-interest. Um, and it's made threats to take over Taiwan. Uh, and it, if you take those threats seriously, uh, you have to say that you need to de-risk. So in that, you know, but it hasn't done beyond that a lot. But we've read those signals very strongly. When I say we, the national security and both parties have read those signals very strongly. And so we're taking very aggressive de-risking. And that's an opportunity because uh, all that production, which is in China, will be moving out. Right now, we're in the first stage where there's what I would describe massive circumvention where goods go from China to Vietnam, China to Mexico, that's just changing the pattern of flow. I think in the next stage, uh, we're going to see a strong U.S. reaction to say, we don't like that circumvention. We're going to have stronger rules of origin. Again, really bad for the seamless world where we were working after World War II where borders didn't matter. But in that new world, being on the right side is going to be very important. And that is going to be a big opportunity for emerging markets and developing countries, um, provided it doesn't get too, too tense where, say, Latin America, which exports a lot of the raw materials to China, isn't told, if you continue to do that, you won't be a place where we feel comfortable buying from you. Let's, let's explore that a bit further. There is indeed, as you say, a bipartisan consensus around the risk that China presents to the United States economically, technologically, in military terms. Um, what if that relationship becomes considerably more adversarial? And countries like those in Latin America, some of which are here today, are forced to make that kind of a choice. I need to ally myself with one of two poles, the Western pole um, or the Chinese pole. Yeah, uh, that's a dark scenario and a really hard one. Um, for um, many of the uh, goods that uh, m many of the things that, that Latin America, for instance, exports, it's raw materials. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and foodstuffs. And foodstuffs. Uh, now, first, on some of this, it would be a good thing because it would force Latin America to move up the value chain and start producing final goods, uh, more value-added. You know, we've maintained since the end of colonialism, since the World War II, a neo-colonial pattern of trade. It is still the case that developing countries and emerging markets are exporting primary goods. The WTO reinforced that neo-colonialism. And we may be at a moment where we might be able to change that, but that's going to be really, really hard. A, a big opportunity, but a really hard uh, challenge. Um, the advantage, by the way, though, of the commodities which are being exported is they're commodities. You can export them to one place and then they can go to someplace else. So I think getting global control over the commodity flows is going to be almost impossible, as we saw as we tried to impose sanctions on oil in Russia. So I think. Um, like water, it'll find its way. It, it, it'll find its way. It, it will, they will be worse off. They'll be, you know, when you go the other ways, it, the flow is a little bit less and the cost is, you know, you'll, the price of that will be a little bit lower. But they'll find a way. It, it sounds to me, based on what you say, that we aren't entering a deglobalized era. There's a reglobalization of sorts going on. Um, what are the rules of that new order going to be, Joe? Yeah, that, that is a very deep question. And, and uh, 
the, the fact that the rules are up for renegotiation uh, is very, very clear. Um, it, uh, Jake Sullivan gave a, a speech a little over a year ago. The at, National Security Advisor. The uh, National Security Advisor and, and, uh, at the Brookings. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically he said, uh, the U.S. is not going to obey the rules so long as China doesn't. And it, its view was China wasn't obeying it. But it refuses to allow the appointment of judges to the appellate body at the WTO, and so can't bring a case to say, is China really disobeying the rules or not? So it's saying, in our judgment, it's disobeying, but we won't allow anybody to review that. So we are in a, a world where the U.S. says that uh, we don't like what the court has done. We won't allow any judges until we rewrite the rules of the court. And a lot of people from emerging markets view is we want to rewrite the rules to make sure that we always win. <laughs> but that's not a court. Uh, that, or that's what we call a kangaroo court. So uh, the overall framework is in paralysis, paralysis. But there's even more, uh, another problem. Uh, you know, the third pillar I talked about uh, uh, of uh, uh, pushing your own in, uh, new industries, uh, that's been reflected in industrial policies. Um, industrial policies were a no-no for 40 years. I mean, when I was at the World Bank, uh, I advocated uh, industrial policies, but, um, you know, uh, the opposition from the U.S. government and from others was very strong. It was against the neoliberal order. And now the U.S. has changed its mind and has massive industrial policy. IRA originally, um, if you, you know, read the bill, it's about, was estimated about $350 billion dollars of subsidies for green energy. The estimates now are somewhere between one and one and a half trillion mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, you probably you put out some of those numbers, I think. We, we, we might have. <laughs> uh, I, I, in fact, the, the, I, I heard the president speaking yesterday and he referred to 1.3 trillion. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So, so that's large and larger than emerging markets can compete with. So Nobody can compete with that. What? No one can no compete one, Even that. Europe. I get complaints from European leaders about, about this. So what was a framework where we had to try to get a level playing field, it was never level, it was really always tilted, has become really tilted. And so, you know, I, I think we have to try to get a new set of rules to rebalance it. And um, I've been pushing... Uh, for saying, uh, you know, it's fine, it's a good thing to have industrial policy, but when you do it, you A, have to give resources to developing and countries and emerging markets to have their own industrial policies, so you can't, it isn't a question of grabbing jobs from the rest of the world, it's creating a better economy for the entire world. So the language has to change, the rules have to change so that if you do it, you, you help the other countries have their own industrial policy specific to the special conditions of emerging markets and developing countries. And thirdly, you have to share technology. And uh, this was an idea, sharing technology, that was in the original 92 Rio Agreement on climate change. And no one's wanted to talk about it. Uh, obviously, uh, just like they didn't like compulsory licenses for health, and we had a huge problem during the pandemic uh, getting uh, Europe to be willing to share the intellectual property, and the result was vaccine apartheid, people dying, people with unnecessary hospitalizations. The same thing is true in climate, and I think uh, bringing back the notion of uh, getting resources, but also getting technology to emerging markets is really important. One ingredient 
in getting resources, just to, we were talking about this, is uh, issuances of SDRs, mm -hmm. special drawing rights, as a new instrument for, on an annual basis, for financing climate change. As I mentioned, Joe, I'd like to open up the floor to questions before I get there. So think of your questions, folks. I do want to ask you another question about regime change, and that has to do with interest rates. Uh, nobody would mistake you for a Fed watcher, but you uh, were among those calling for a 50 basis point cut in interest rates uh, prior to last week's rate decision from the FOMC. And of course, we did get a 50 basis point cut. And so instead of being in a tightening cycle, we now appear to be in an easing cycle. And everyone here knows how much havoc the tightening cycle wreaked on emerging markets in terms of uh, currency differentials in terms of the sheer cost of borrowing because you had to entice buyers with such a huge premium over uh, high U.S. interest rates. What should people be thinking of as we enter this easing cycle? How do they take advantage of that? Yeah, it, 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 I, I've been a, a big critic of the Fed for raising interest rates too far and too fast. So I really welcomed uh, uh, cutting it back. Um, I thought it had misdiagnosed the source of inflation, that it was uh, inflation driven by uh, pandemic and war related supply chain interruptions and demand shifts that were associated with those events and the, and the supply shortages. And that, ironically, I believed uh, that the markets would solve those problems. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, it was so amazing that how many central banks didn't believe in market solving problems, and they decided to make it more difficult for the markets to solve that problem by raising interest rates. You don't solve a shortage of housing by raising interest rates, and you don't s solve a shortage of, of, of uh, energy by saying it's more difficult to invest in energy. It was really a crazy policy when you think about it. Uh, so finally, they got the hint, and they, they did cut it back. It's really important, I think, for developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, those who were on the verge of crisis, and there are several, uh, some of them over the uh, point of crisis, debt crisis, uh, are in a much better position. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's relieved some of the pressure but they should not take advantage of this by getting more in debt. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have clearly spent a lot of time studying uh, the current Fed policy. Do you have a sense as to how much further the Fed should go in cutting interest rates from, we've seen 50 basis points uh, beyond that, how much further they should go? Well, and you know, it, some of this depends on how fast inflation moderates. Comes down, moderates, it come down, uh, you know, it took a little while, but it's come down now quite robustly. Um, and um, so if it in fact came down to two, two and a half percent, um, you know, historically, the real interest rates, re, you know, adjusted for inflation, uh, have been in the range of one half percent to one and a half percent. Mm -hmm. uh, if you took the upper range of one and a half percent, and we get inflation down to 2%, uh, we shouldn't have a market interest rate over 3.5%. Mm -hmm. So I would like it to come down a, somewhat more. Folks, do we have any questions from the audience? Please raise your hands. As I said, there are mics. Uh, we have a mic. Here it, here it is. Uh, why don't we go to the front row here first? Just a moment, we're gonna get that mic up and running. Thank you. I'm Patrick Muyaya, Communication Minister and the spokesperson of the Democratic Republic of Congo government. So I'm, I'm happy to be part of this conversation. I just came back from China, where the President Xi hosted all uh, African countries with this big meeting we call FOCAC. Uh, one of the main differences, if you have to compare the approach of China with Africa, is that they come. They put money on the table straight. 
the question with Western country, which we, which is uh, we are closer to Africa than China, most of the time before they come on the table very concretely, they come up with questions like human rights, democracy, etc. And then sometimes when they look at on African continent, they look at African continent with American eyes. So if you have an American eyes, I'm not sure you can appreciate what kind of effort we are doing on moving forward for questions like democracy, human rights, etc. Uh, I, I was listening to you, Professor, in the beginning. It means that even after 200 years, America is still fighting for its democracy. And I think it will be good in the approach not to try to democratize Africa, but to Africanize democracy. I think by changing this view, it will be good and better for you in the way we can deal with economy. To come specifically about my country, which is, I think, one of the most important countries in the world. Uh, today, we are speaking about climate change. We have one of the biggest forests. When we speak about cobalt, we have 70% of cobalt in the DRC. When you have to speak about coltan and all those mineral resources, most of them come from the DRC. It's not only now. I think everybody watched last year Oppenheimer movie, uh, Oppenheimer, about atomic bomb. The main component come from the DRC. And the first non-American citizen we get the highest medal of honor in this country is a Belgian engineer who was leading at that moment the Jeka Mines, the Union Minière, the company who produced cobalt in the US. It means that there is a lot of solution for the world that can come from DRC. But if I have to compare, we have, of course, very good relationship with uh, United States, but economically, we don't have very much investment. And if I have to go back on the presentation made by Madame Lupita, saying that there is instability is one of the reasons why investors cannot come. So my question is, for a country like mine, for the past 30 years, we've been dealing with a war with Rwanda. We know the main reason of this war is about mineral resources. So they are using proxies to get Colton and selling Colton. And then we start like a small like process against Apple because we think that somehow there is some materials which come from DRC which was which a result of war and all those bad things. What do you think must be the new strategy for United States for the coming president about country like DRC, which is one of the biggest countries in Africa, and where there is answers for the world, but where most of the time we, not, we don't come concretely to take risk to say we don't need in DRC one billion or two billion. We need 50 billion because the country has the potential to reimburse. What can be the approach for a country like DRC and for the Africa and both all? Thank you. Joe, the minister well, raises some very good points and, and, and a very valid question. Those are great questions. Uh, and you know the standard joke. You, you, I'm sure you've heard it, which is that uh, the difference between China is and and the United States is that uh, if you go to the United States, uh, you'll get a lecture, and when you go to China, you get money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, and uh, the 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 fact of the matter is that we haven't had. Uh, a global strategy for we we started a cold uh, what I, you might call a new cold war people sometimes disagree with what, whether this is like the old cold war but that's not the, we're, we are in a kind of new geopolitics where we're we're competing for the hearts and minds of people in the third world but we don't have a strategy in fact if you look at what we've done I think we've alienated many people in the third world like with our vaccine, with our intellectual property, our vaccine. You, you look at at um, uh, there's a discussion, you know, at the UN of of creating a multinational fair tax arrangement. The African Union was very 
influential at getting that move from the OECD, which is the club of the rich countries, into the UN. And when it came just uh, a few weeks ago to vote on the terms of reference of this tax convention, one of six countries to vote against it was the United States. A few years ago in 2015, at the UN, we had a discussion about a framework for re restructuring debt, because many developing countries have too much debt. The United States was one of six countries to vote against the principles of debt restructuring. So I hope the new Harris, uh, I hope she gets elected, but I hope, if she does, when, uh, that they will understand that we are engaged in a new global, you know, we, the, the era of colonialism is over, that we need to have a new kind of engagement which engages Africa and other developing countries, emerging markets, on their own terms. And uh, I think what the United States has been through in the last, since 2016, shows that democracy is really hard. It really constant is. Constant struggle. What? It's a, a constant, constant struggle. struggle. It, it isn't, you know, you pass a law in, eight, in, in 1789 and it's done. <laughs> Um, in 1789, we had slavery, women couldn't vote, you had, had property to vote. We didn't have a democracy as we would know it today. And we've had a struggle, we had a war. So, and we, that struggle is going on right now. There are people engaged in voter suppression and all of that. So it is a struggle that every country has to go through and we have to recognize that that is a struggle. I think we want to share our values of how important democracy is, share what we've learned from our struggle and from the struggle in Spain and Greece and Chile and the other countries that have struggled. You know, that, so it's not a, we don't have a monopoly on that struggle. Uh, it's been a struggle in so many countries and if we could get a, a, a good dialogue of what it means, you know, I just, was talking to uh, Muhammad Yunus, you know, they've been through a struggle in Bangladesh. Um, so it, it's a common struggle, and we ought to be sharing what we've learned from that common struggle. There's one more thing I'll just mention uh, that relates to uh, the ownership of key natural resources or two things uh, of key natural resources. I mentioned one aspect before. I think uh, it's really important that as part of the development strategy that we, the United States and the West, ought to be supporting, that more of what we sometimes call the beneficiation, the more of the value added ought to be going on in these countries. The WTO was designed to make sure that uh, the countries remain producing primary goods and the value added occurred in advanced countries. That has to change. And uh, Europe has to recognize, for instance, uh, that they should not be objecting to Indonesia's attempt to get value added in nickel. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, ex ex Indonesia's industrial policy, and it's working in Indonesia. And we ought to be helping you in your industrial policy think about how you can use your valuable natural resources to become uh, a richer country. And you're a rich country to become a richer <laughs> country. And then the, the, the final thing uh, is, uh, for a long while, uh, neoliberalism uh, took the view that Ownership was not important. We ought to let anybody own any asset anywhere. And that was, the, you know, the free mobility of capital. Uh, we changed that dramatically. We don't want TikTok to be owned by China. <laughs> uh, but even more, we've become concerned about nat who owns the natural resources of DRC and the other countries. Well, of course, the real ownership 
belongs to the people of DRC. But the operational responsibility had been with American companies, but it's all been switched, a lot of it's been switched to China. I worry that, you know, and this is maybe a little bit American jingoism, that China is more of a colonial power than the Ameri America was. And that you won't get the full value of your resources. Hmm. And I think your responsibility is to make sure that the full value of those resources go to the people of DRC, not to America, not to China. And that may need, mean that you will have to renationalize those resources. And that's a different change in property rights. You know, Americans would not like that principle. You may not call it renationalization. We'll figure out a way, another language. <laughs> I, can, I can help you do that uh, so you don't get, uh, you know, chastised. But the, the basic principle is that in one way or another, your responsibility is to make sure that those, the value of those resources, which are enormous, go to the people of your country and say, we can help you do that. Joe, I'm- Not the American government, but I mean, American academia. I, I'm very mindful of everyone's time here, so we're gonna take one more brief question uh, in the front row here and, and a brief answer oh, because I'm sorry. I- sorry. No, 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 it's quite all right. I think that was, that was a very, very useful answer to the minister and to everyone else here. So thank you for asking, thank you for answering. Joe, please go ahead. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Frank Tayali. I'm the Minister for Transport and Logistics from the Republic of Zambia. I want to say that, um, first of all, I'm not an economist. I'm an engineer come lawyer. And um, this discussion this morning kind of like makes it murky for me to, to appreciate because just yesterday we witnessed a very historic moment and that was the signing of a concession agreement for the development of the Lobito Corridor. Uh, this is a, a corridor, obviously, that's being championed by the U.S. government. And it's been elating for us as, uh, you know, emerging markets that uh, it sort of like symbolizes a shift in American policy to, towards Africa and uh, basically towards um, how the U.S., perhaps has come to the realization that they need to get back on the African continent and be able to counter um, some of the activities that uh, the East have uh, promoted on the continent. Um, the U.S. has actually backed this project with quite uh, some substantial amount of money and obviously promoting private sector participation. When you speak about uh, reindustrialization, one would be of the opinion that uh, this would further enhance the shift of primary goods to be able to come and be beneficiated from America, which perhaps is a contradiction to what uh, we on the continent have equally awakened and realized that uh, we need value addition for our raw materials within continent. And just about perhaps a year ago, we did sign with the support of the U.S. government um, that technology would be shared between Zambia and the DRC with the support of the U.S. to be able to manufacture batteries. And that instead of exporting cobalt and copper, we would be exporting batteries. So your prediction about a shift in U.S. policy uh, regarding reindustrialization and bringing back industries to the U.S., won't this hurt the African continent, because we are also quite now um, happy to change our approach and say that uh, no more taking out primary materials. We actually need industry set up, and this is what the Lobito Corridor is all about. It's actually an economic corridor where we hope that uh, industries um, for the extractive you know, minerals, as well as agriculture, may be set up, and that will be sending to the U.S. finished products as opposed to raw materials. Your comment. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so gr glad that the Biden administration has already begun the agenda that I've been advocating. 
I think you're absolutely right that there has to be more beneficiation done in Africa. And one of the challenges within the American politics will be how do we uh, um, uh, integrate this into our new industrial uh, policy. I think we can. I think it will be actually an advantage to us. Um, th this is the perspective I said, it's not a zero sum, it's a positive sum. If we get Africa to grow, it's a better for the world, uh, it's, uh, and that's going to be better uh, for the United States. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm really very strongly supportive of that, and I think if Harris gets elected, you'll see a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you'll see that, you know, most strongly in climate because that's where a lot of people's mind was. I, I was talking yesterday to the National Security Advisor a, a member of, uh, on climate environment and, you know, pushing this kind of agenda uh, and, and he was very receptive to it. So, so what I'm saying is that kind of idea that you're talking about is is the kind of thing I think that we'll see a lot more of. Um, one of the things that I, I've talked about, and I, I hope we can get done, it's a, it's a, new, a couple of new ideas, um, is uh, to get into the IRA, you, want, you have to have a free trade agreement. Well, the word free trade agreement is a, no, we have, there are no such thing as real free trade, they're all managed trade agreements. So, I've been arguing that we ought to have green free trade agreements where we agree about sharing technology and helping countries move towards a greener global economy because if we don't do it in emerging markets, we're not going to solve. It's a global problem. And allow that to be part of the IRA framework. So that would be one answer. Uh, another one that people are talk beginning to talk about is uh, a North Atlantic uh, zone, which would include Africa, the west coast of Africa uh, particularly, and Latin America as a, a, a zone of cooperation. And, uh, you know, and, and moving beyond trade, because technology is so important in, 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 in the growth, and that was one of the things uh, uh, I just wanted to highlight one of the things that Andriana said. Trade, uh, I mean, um, tax advantages are really down on the list of things that make foreign investment work. Technology was way up on mm. that list. And the capabilities of people were way up on that list. So let's emphasize more technology and training and education and use that as a framework for, for getting global, more global cooperation. I wish we could go on. Sadly, everything must come to an end. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming. I hope you can see that we here at Bloomberg New Economy are serious about bridging the divide between the global north and the global south. We are serious about mobilizing capital for the public good. I hope you'll join us in Sao Paulo and at our events in the future. On behalf of Mike, on behalf of Karen, once again, thank you for coming and joining us. And most importantly, please join me in thanking Professor Joseph Stieglitz. Thank you.